Okay, so I'm going to try to record this again in the absence of other students because of the shit show that was today. Hopefully I'll have this worked out and we'll all be better for it. Okay, last class we finished talking about energy. And so I'll continue with our definitions to look at scientific terminology such as hypothesis, theory, and law. So, assuming this will click over. Okay, so this first thing is our hypothesis. Hypothesis is a model or statement based on the observation of natural phenomena. Now, uh, the, the, the important thing is that, so you, you observe sun in nature. You see sun, you're like, what, what's going on? And you try to explain that using your hypothesis. Now, it doesn't have to be correct. It just has to be provable. It has to be testable. So I'd say, like, well, the Earth looks flat from right here, so I hypothesize the Earth is flat. Well, if it was flat and it ends somewhere, why doesn't the water run off the edge? Well, maybe there's a giant ice wall that prevents all the water from running off in the edge. So how can you test that? You might be able to test that by, say, flying into outer space, leaving the Earth, and looking down and seeing, is that provable? Well, yes, that is provable, and no, that's not true. So, a hypothesis doesn't have to be right. Lightning was created by Thor being angry, or thunder is created by angels bowling in heaven. Whatever the hypothesis, it needs to be provable. That's the big thing. Okay, with that in mind. So, you take a hypothesis, you perform some experiments. You could go two ways. One, it doesn't fit the results don't uh, fit the hypothesis. So we go back to the drawing board and rehypothesize what went wrong. And so we go, okay, so how can we better explain this? But if it does fit the hypothesis, we move on and we keep testing. Multiple tests, to, does this confirm? Maybe take this to other scientists and say, does this confirm can they get the same results? All this to solve the same problem. If we keep this up, eventually we can build this into a theory. So a theory is a special type of hypothesis. Not only does it correctly explain the data, but it's also going to withstand repeated testing by multiple different scientists. But the most important thing is that it's going to predict future outcomes. So it's not just it answers all the experiments we've currently done, but I can think of an experiment that would work with this theory and test it, and I know the what the outcome should be before I've even run the experiment. That's, what a, that's the sign of a good theory. Uh, now, it's generally should be consistent with all related theories. But, and the one thing here is that a theory explains what's going on. It doesn't just state this is what's happening, but explains why this happens. So, theories can still be wrong. We look at the Einsteinian, well, we look at Newtonian physics like the billiard balls moving on an inclined plane, objects in motion will tend to be in motion until acted upon otherwise. All that's true, and all that's still valid, but along came Einstein, and we started looking at wavelengths of light and particle and wave theory, and light doesn't quite fit Einstein, uh, Newtonian physics. And so there is something better the Newtonian physics out there. Newtonian physics still works for big objects, you and me, but it does not correctly predict this phenomenon. So we have to replace it with a better model. And that's where we get to a law. 
A law is a statement of consistent behavior of national phenomenon. So this always occurs under standard set of conditions. So, well, it's an observation without an explanation. It, the basic idea is it, it is a statement of fact. Looking back at our energy, we have the law of conservation of energy. It states energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It doesn't explain why this is, how this comes to be, just a statement that energy it cannot come out of nothingness and will never disappear into nothingness. It can only dissipate. It can only transfer. So example of a, there's, we can look at the law of gravity. Or we can look at the, we can look at the theory of gravity. The law of gravity just says we're all going to experience gravity. Gravity holds us onto earth. The law of gravitation says that the force is proportional to a constant, the mass of one object, the mass of a second object divided by the distance between it. We don't need to know this equation, but the idea here is that explains those all numbers explain why we experience 9.8 meters per second squared gravitational energy. It, but not only can it predict stuff for us, it can predict how we treat the moon. How does the moon? The moon has a set mass. The earth has a set mass. The distance between the moon is more or less constant. So we can predict what gravitational force we the earth applies on the moon and the moon applies on the earth. And with that in mind, we can thus predict the tidal force that the moon pulls on us. So now we're going to start getting into the math portion of this chapter. So first thing we need to look at is the international system of units, the SI units. We're going to go through a bunch of SI units and the metric system is our base. The, the metric system is a base 10 system that allows us to convert any unit into any other base 10 unit. So it's an easier conversion from distance to larger distance. Unlike in, uh, in the English system, we have 12 inches to a foot. We have three feet to a yard. We have, what, 5,280 feet to a mile. All that's not really super convenient. Not the same way as, well, we have uh, 10 millimeters to a centimeter, 10 centimeters to a decimeter, 10 decimeters to a meter, 10 meters to a like, decameter, 10 decameters to a hectometer, 10 hectometers to a kilometer. So it keeps on going up by a factor of 10. Oftentimes it will jump by factors of 1,000, but it's a really convenient way to always know a conversion. Now, there are the SI unit for all types of measurements. This may not be the most convenient unit we will always use, but it's the standard unit. If you want to measure distance, we always use a meter. We want to use mass, even though gram is the base, we will use kilogram as the SI unit. If we want to use time, we'll be dealing with seconds. If we want to use temperature, we'll do Kelvin. If we want to use amount of something, we'll use moles. We won't really deal with current or, or luminosity, but they have SI units of amperes and candelas. Those are SI units. And we're going to use these units to drive just about every other unit. Now you'll see the, the metric system prefixes to the right over here. And what that does is that those are the prefixes, the most common prefixes. The ones we need to know are underlined. The rest are just little fun ones. So the first major one is the absent one. It's the no prefix needed. A meter, a gram, an ampere, a second. That's our 10 to the zeroth power. 
but when we get bigger and smaller, we add the prefixes, like a kilometer is a thousand or 10 to the third meters. A megameter is 10 to the sixth meters. Now you can know if you know, well then gigameter, if you know anything about storage, you could say then what well, after giga would maybe be tera and so on. Going smaller, we have centimeters would be 10 to the negative second meters, millimeters, 10 to the negative third. And then we start jumping by factors of three, micro and nano. One way to remember these guys is centimeter. It's like a centipede or century, a hundred years. Milli is like a millipede or a millennium, a thousand years. The micro, which is the Greek letter mu, is we use a microscope to look at bacteria, which are smaller than a millipede. The nano, 10 to the negative ninth, we nanoparticles. We, we cannot use a microscope to look at individual atoms. We need something that can measure something that is smaller to do that. So, looking at the next step is deriving a series of units. Distance only goes us so far. We need to be able to take that and go into volume and density and velocity. And all these units are made up of our SI units one way or another. So, volume is the space taken up by matter. Now, the SI unit for this is meters cubed. We took a length, we took a width, we took a height, and we made this meter cube. We took boom, boom, and then we, so distance one, distance two, distance three, suddenly I have a volume. Multiply those three things together, m by m by m gets us meters cubed. But that's not always convenient for us. So we often use liters. But there is a way to convert meters cubed, which is our SI derived unit, into liters. One convenient one is centimeters cubed, or cc's, is equal to one milliliter. That's a one-to-one -one conversion. Now, density. Density is a mass divided by a volume. So the SI unit for mass is kilograms. The SI unit for volume is meters cubed. So density should be kilograms per meter cubed, but oftentimes we might look at this as grams per liter or grams per milliliter. But this is an intrinsic property. Doesn't depend on the amount of a substance. So the density will never change because it's one SI unit over another SI unit. The velocity and acceleration, that's looking at distance over time or velocity over time. So we're taking the SI unit distance, meters, and the SI unit time, seconds, or seconds per second to get velocity and acceleration. Force often measured in a newton, but a newton is, or force is just a mass times acceleration. So the unit for force is kilograms, the mass, times meters per second squared, the acceleration. And that is equal to one newton. And we can have a kilonewton, a millinewton, all those things. Micronewton, but it's looking at the SI we're deriving this from a mass and acceleration. Energy, which is a joule. It's the most common unit, unit we'll see repeatedly. But what is a energy? It's a force applied over a distance. So we take our force, a newton, and multiply by meters. Newton meters becomes a joule. But also, force is also a kilogram meters per second squared. And we multiply by another meter, so, looking at the derived unit, kilogram meters 
over second times second, if we multiply by another meter, we get kilograms meter cubed, meter squared over second squared. So they combine together on that. And finally, frequency, often measured in hertz, but we could also measure this in inverse seconds. So it's one over a second. Those are some of the derived units we will be using throughout the year. So this right here is our first real math. We, we, this is hopefully a review, but it's there to help you because we need to be able to express scientific notation and use our calculator correctly. This is some of the hardest parts of class. If you can't do this, you're going to have a bad time. So let's work with this. If I want to write 602, point, uh, 602 to the 23rd, if I try to write that whole number, it's really, really, really impractical. So scientific notation is given in this form. C, our number, times 10 raised to the power of X, where our number C is somewhere between 1 and 10. And the the X or the N is how many decimal places we had to move. So I would much rather see 1.05 times 10 to the fourth than 10.5 10 to the third. Of these two options, that guy is out because that first number is greater than 10. So this is a convenient way of saying one, zero, five, zero. That's a convenient way to express that number. Oh, sorry. One, two, so one, zero, five, zero, zero. My bad. Convenient way to express that number. So. First example, 5.23 times uh, 523. We look at that. We look at that. 5.23. We're going to put the imaginary decimal in and move it 1, 2 to the left. So that goes to 5.23 times 10 to the second. Our next example. 0 0.00 0 0.026. The decimal is already there. I'm going to move this one, two, three, four to the right, making this 2.6 times 10 to the negative fourth. So that is a quick reminder of how we would do this. Convert one to the other and back. Okay. Now, how do we do this in our calculator? Hypothetically, you can just type in the whole thing and be done with it. You can say 5.23x10 carrot two, but that leads to a lot of button presses and sometimes you can lead to some errors down the road. Oftentimes I will use one of these three buttons, the EE button, the EXP button, or the 10 to the X button. All of these are ways of abbreviating this whole center region, this whole center region of 10 to the X. this whole 10 to the X region. So, so instead of writing 5.23 times 10 to the second, I can write 5.23 EE to the two and just hit two. 
instead of saying 2.6 times 10 negative 4, I can write 2.6 EE negative sign 4. And that will give me the same thing. Oftentimes when I'm writing on the board, I may do this. I might write this. I'm going to erase some of this stuff. I might write this as 5.23 E2. Now that E is standing for that exponential. So it's saying 5.23 raised to the second power. And that is perfectly acceptable. And that's how your calculator is often going to give that. So don't be overly confused when you see that. Now this next mathematical step is not something you need to rack your brain over. But if you can hold these rules true, it can help you in the long run. That These rules of exponents will help you figure out if your number looks right before you write it down or hit submit. The idea here is that when you multiply two numbers with exponents, you are the same as adding the exponents together. 10 to the fourth times 10 to the third is 4 plus 3, 10 to the seventh. The same thing with dividing. Dividing is the same as sub subtraction. 10 to the ninth divided by 10 to the third, 9 minus 3 is 10 to the sixth. This will help you in the long run. So if you're multiplying a big number by a big number, you expect a bigger number. If you divide a big number by a big number, you expect a little number. And hopefully you can see that so you make sure you didn't divide when you meant to multiply or multiply when you meant to divide by these guys. So hopefully you can recognize I expect a small number, and if I get a big number, I know I screwed up. Same thing, if I multiply a positive exponent by a negative exponent, it's this adding a negative or subtracting a positive. So if I say 10 to the, a quick trial, you can maybe follow along at home on your calculator, but if I said 10 to the fifth times 10 to the negative second, a big number, and a small number, the result should be a smaller number, 10 to the third. Because 5 plus a negative 2 will give us 3. Same thing. When I raise an exponent to an exponent, it's the same as multiplying the two numbers together. 10 to the third raised to the fourth power would be 3 times 4, or 12. Taking the root is the same as dividing by whatever that root. A square root is considered 2. A third root is considered divided by 3. So square rooting 10 to the fourth is the same as 4 divided by 2, or 2. So just keep these things in mind. They are there only to help you with your, your basics, if you can realize your, prob your, your problem looks wrong, you can save yourself some trouble before you get there. Because oftentimes you will say, if you're doing exponents and you're doing these numbers, if you're trying to say 5.23 times 10 to the second divided by 2.6 times 10 to the negative fourth, a lot of people will type this in as 5.23 times 10 second divided by 2.6 times 10 to the negative fourth. And what you'll get is this result. You'll get this result be because order of operations will kick you in the spleen when you're not looking. That can be solved with that EE -E button, but that can also be solved by recognizing I'm dividing a big number by a small number. I damn well better get a bigger number.
So if I suddenly come up with a smaller number than 5.23 times 10 to the second, I know I screwed up. So, so moving on to significant digits. This is one of the hardest things. We're looking at numbers and what meanings do they have? What meaning do they have? And numbers, when we apply units to numbers, that's when we turn math into science. That's why we need units. You may have heard online that 2 plus 2 equals 5 because you have... Well, if I put two, chick two hens and two roosters come back, there's five chickens now. Well, that's because we're not using proper units. You're trying to add A to B and suddenly surprised when it's not A plus A. Well, if you added two, chicken, two hens to two hens, you're not going to get five chickens. So there's some degree of uncertainty in there. Like, oh, if I combine, I have one factory with two working machines and a half working machine and another factory with two working machines and a half working machine and we combine factories together, suddenly I have five working machines. Well, that's because you just ignored those half working machines because 2.5 plus 2.5 definitely equals five, but two plus two doesn't. We need to watch out for our units here. Watch out for our significant digits. We're not, we're ignoring certain factors here. So, looking at here, numbers will fall into two categories, exact numbers and it, under uh, numbers with some degree of uncertainty. Exact numbers are numbers we know without any degree of uncertainty. We know a thousand percent. They could be because we're counting them. Like if I count the number of chickens in the in the barnyard and I count it perfectly and I say, oh, there's 10 chickens in the barnyard, then I know there's 10 chickens. I don't have to go, is it 10.5 chickens? Is it 10 and a half chicken? Is it 10.8 chickens? No, we know it's 10 chickens because I counted it. If I... By definition, what does that mean? By definition, well, by definition, there is exactly three feet and one yard. So whenever I say there's one yard, I know it's exactly three feet. That is by definition. I don't have to know, is it 3.2 feet, 4.1 feet? No, it's three feet. That is how we have defined a foot. There are 12 inches in one foot. We don't have to guess how many inches are actually in there. We know by definition there is 12 in one. Those are exact numbers. Inexact numbers or numbers with uncertainty are one either we physically measured or they're too big to count. Basically there is some degree of uncertainty. We do not know them exactly. They do not know them exactly. We can approximate pretty close to it, but we can't get it there. How many people showed up in the sports arena if you don't actually count every single person? How many people came to the Million Man March if you didn't physically have a tally counter checking in every single person? We can approximate based on different scientific factors. You can say, you can measure the amount of area covered and approximate how many people per area. It's like each person takes up a five by five, a two by two foot space and they're covering like four acres and you can go, oh, okay, so that means we should have approximately this many people. So we're gonna do a lot with uncertainty. Uncertainty, exists in all measurable quantities and it, it's 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 whether it could be in the general accuracy of a number or the precision of those numbers we don't really know now accuracy is how close we are to a predetermined correct answer 
uh, precision is how consistent the results are. So, so let's take an example of I have a balance that weighs the mass of a compound. This balance will, uh, this balance, I am calibrating it with a five gram mass that weighs exactly 5.000 grams. So if I put this on the balance and it weighs 5.003 grams, see it's relatively accurate. If it weighs 5.803 grams, say it's not very accurate. If I measure this mass three times, if I get 5.003, 4.999, 5 5.005, let's say it's relatively precise. There's very little deviation from my number. But if it goes, well, it's 5.003, oh, one of them's lucky, 5.250, and then 4.75, see, it's not very precise. Yes, the average is pretty accurate, but it varied pretty wildly depending on when I measured it. So if I took enough ac measurements, maybe it will still be accurate. But if I got one, took one measurement, it could be way off. So we could be accurate and not precise. We could be precise and not accurate. We could be neither accurate nor precise, or we could be both. And we want to be both accurate and precise if we can. But there's numerous degrees of uncertainty that can be that can come. They can either come from human error. You've made mistakes. You didn't follow instructions. But also it could be equipment error. Like the balance isn't properly calibrated, or perhaps the equipment is dirty and it doesn't give the correct number of uh, correct sample size. But all this will lead to significant figures or sig figs or significant digits for short. The first major reading assignment and topic of the major learning curve. So a significant digit or significant figure. It's one we can reliably report to some degree of accuracy. So we want to report all of our numbers as accurately as possible without any bullshit. We want people to know and trust our numbers. It's much easier to lose significant figures than it is to gain them. So if I use my calculator and type in a number, say I wanted to cut a 10 meter board into seven equal portions. It would say I should cut them in 1.428571.4286. So, real quick, erase this. So, let's just look at it. If this is 10 meters and I want to cut this into one, two, three, four, six, oh. uh, yeah, that's what, okay, seven. It says I should cut each of these approximately 1.428571.4286, and that's probably that five, seven repeating meters. How accurately am I going to try to measure that? Well, I don't have a ruler that's going to go into that distance, so I'm limited by my equipment how closely I can measure this. How accurately can I record this? Well, the meter stick, say it goes into, there's 100 centimeters in that, and it measures also millimeters. Well, it, it, it has marks at the centimeter length. Well, the centimeter is right here. I, if I'm lucky, can maybe approximate that. But say it doesn't have marks for centimeters. I can maybe, it has them marked down for decimeters. Then maybe I can only go up to 1.43. It all depends. 
For example, what if the board isn't exactly 10 meters? It's close enough to 10, close enough to 10, but it's 10.1 or 10.03 meters. If I cut it in, one of these boards is going to be slightly longer because of the uncertainty of this. And we're trying to deal with uncertainty here. So how can we measure this? You're going to get a lot of artifacts that you can't necessarily use. So there's a rule. There's a rule that whenever we read off a piece of paper or off a ruler or other measurement device, every non-zero number reported is significant. Everything, so if I, if I gave you the distance of this board is 1.43 meters, I'm giving you all the significant digits you need. All those are given. Every non-zero number. If I'm uh, reading this off a ruler and I can only go out to 1.43 places, that's as far as we're going to go. Now, the tricky part here is zeros. Zeros can either be significant or non-significant, depending on where they are. A significant zero tells us something about the digit, that it's not one higher or one lower. A non-significant zero, it just tells us that it is big or small. So let's go back to our example of one zero five zero zero that we talked about at the very, very beginning. This zero tells us it's 10,500. It's not 9,500. It's not 11,500, but it's 10,500. We're gonna learn about these zeros being, we don't know, is it 500? Or is it 499? Is it four? Is it 510? We don't know. And so those zeros are going to be non significant. But how we're going to do this is by looking at the decimal or the lack thereof. Depending on whether we reported a decimal or not reported a decimal, is going to depend on the rules. And the rules are exactly the opposite depending decimal or not decimal. So when there is zero decimals, no decimals, any zeros to the left of the last non-zero number are non-significant. So we take the last number, the last number, five. That's our big number, five. Or five. And we're gonna count to the left. Every number to the left of that five is significant. Every number to the right is not. So without a zero, every number to the left of that five is significant. Without a decimal, every number to the right is not. When we have a decimal, everything changes. 0 0.00026, I'm gonna add another zero. We take the first non-zero number and count and go right. The first non-zero number and we go right. So we say, well, that two is the first non-zero and it's moving to the right. So everything to the right of that is significant. So how would we make those last two zeros of the 10500 significant, we would add a decimal. Then suddenly that one is our important thing and we move to the right because we have that decimal there. Okay. Now, when we turn these numbers into significant notation, uh, the non-significant zeros would be removed and we keep only the significant zeros. So 
5040, we keep 504 times 10 to the third. We lose that last non-significant zero. Now, one other thing about significance, we'll probably talk about this again next class, but when you're measuring something, when you're measuring a rule using a ruler, measuring with a ruler, we look to the last marking when we measure this. We look the one marking past the last. So if I have a ruler, so one, two, anyway, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine. So there are markings every 10 unit. Say this is a centimeter, this is a millimeter, the uncertainty comes in this region. So while I'd be measuring this in centimeters, I would say if my object goes to here, I would say this is one, well, that's not quite one. It'd be 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 2 centimeters. The uncertainty here is that I've somewhere between the five and the six position on the millimeter, somewhere between the five and the six position. So I have to approximate. This approximation is the last significant digit. Everything beyond that is unknown. Is this five to eight, five to six? I don't know. The non-significant digit is an unknown X that we cannot report because the reporting of this number is the continuation of a unknown, a falsehood that we are spreading saying, I know this, but I don't, I really don't. And so we're only reporting what we can know. So this is where we got to in the class. I wish you a good day. I will see you on Friday.